<laughs> um, so once again, I agree with like everything Jonathan said. He's he just says it at a level that I that I would have to write for hours to be able to put out there. <laughs> it's up here. It just doesn't come out as as fluently as his does. He's just he's great. Anyway, um, so carnivore for me. I wanted it to be an elimination diet. I wanted it to be a healing diet. I think if you have things wrong with your body, which everybody, by the time they get to their 30s and 40s and up, um, has something going on that they need to heal, usually. Um, Mine was chronic candida, which, I mean, I want to knock on wood. I don't want to say I'm healed from it, but, like, it appears that I might be. (laughs) I don't know. Anyway. Um, So that, and then also, I mean, just like the tons of symptoms that I had, they're almost all gone. And I think it's because most people don't react to meat, you know, unless they have like alpha gal or some kind of weird uh, protein disease, or I don't know what even that would consist of. But, um, but most people, meat is a very, um, you know, neutral kind of food where you can eat it and you're not going to have a lot of digestive upset. Um, I have noticed, though, Nicole, and I hadn't even told you this yet, so this is like breaking news. Um, Since I started adding back a few things here and there, um, I had a little episode. We're going to call it an episode because this is not ideal, right? I've sworn off wheat for my entire life. I've not eaten wheat regularly in probably five years. But I had a little episode with some Cheddar Bay Biscuits. And we all know that those aren't the greatest, right? Um, Red Lobster makes them and then they put them in a package for you to buy and make it home. And and we did that. And I ate like a two or three of them. And I normally have a horrible reaction to wheat. And I'm talking about just like immediately sinus stuff, sneezing, very weird stuff. And I, and I attribute it to leaky gut, you know, um, that's a real thing. And, and <laughs> it's a uh, very kind of controversial. It's becoming less controversial. Um, but you know, those, those things do get into your bloodstream and cause worse problems than they did. And uh, that's a whole rabbit hole there. But anyway, this time when I ate the wheat, I didn't have any symptoms at all. And I know the dose determines the poison, but I gave enough dose with three of those to, you know, I would have had a reaction before. So I feel like my my gut is being healed by the meat. Um, it's it's a trial and error kind of thing. It's I, I can't say that for sure. I don't have the blood testing to say that for sure or the stool testing and all the stuff I had before the functional medicine doctor. Um, but I feel so much better. And, and when I'm adding this stuff back in, I'm not feeling like I was before. So I don't plan to keep wheat in my diet because it is very inflammatory, but you know, that's what I think the carnivore diet's good for. Um, you know, these people on TikTok, it's, it's like the wild west over there. I mean, you're going to get the most dr- dramatic and just, just crazy wild things over there. Most of us don't eat, any of that stuff, <laughs> you know, certainly not eyeballs or testicles or, I mean, you all speak for yourselves, but, um, yeah. but I have, but I have eaten steak every day for like two months and that, um, uh, while it was good and I think it was healing in a sense to me, um, I didn't, I definitely didn't lose weight doing that, that I gained weight eating ribeye every day. And, you know, they, they say you can't, but mm, you can. <laughs> I'm proof. <laughs> That's all. Cool. Yeah. That, yeah. People who say you can't gain weight, eating fat and all that. I was like, yes, you can. It's all about overeating. But uh, before I continue, uh, do you have any final words on that, Jonathan? Or are we good to go, good to roll? No, we're good to go. We're probably going to cover a lot more in this video anyway. We've got quite a bit left to do, I think. Yeah. 
A major claim of the carnivore diet is that a meat-based diet is our primal, natural, ancestral way of eating. And that's where all these purported health benefits are supposed to come from. And the thing is, carnivores are kind of right about this. Experts agree that early humans definitely ate meat. Some experts think we ate a lot of meat. Other experts think it was more mixed. While virtually no experts think that we were pure vegetarians. No, thank you. Why do you not eat mammoths? Oh, uh, me doing this thing, uh, this little Pleisto diet thing right now. What that? It's stupid fad diet. Affordable design. Endless possibilities. IKEA. We are increasing production in our U.S. onshore business. Like in the Permian Basin, home to hundreds of BP employees and gas and oil wells, where we plan to finish electrifying 95% of our conventional wells this year. No. So yeah, early humans ate meat. No argument from me there. But experts also seem to agree that early humans were omnivores. Why does that fact seem to be being conveniently ignored? This is what I ate today on my raw meat lifestyle. As I'm doing my morning routine, I'm reminded of the tragic fact that many people start their mornings with a big hot cup of toxic bean juice. Now this girl isn't considered to be a carnivore authority, but she's pretty fun, so I had to include her. What if we all replaced our espresso shots with a shot of raw liver? So coffee is toxic bean juice, but she chases raw liver with Jarrito soda and cooks the liver in syrup. I feel like most of the carnivores are trolling, but it's scary that you can't be sure. That's not even the worst of it either. This carnivore's logic also includes gazing directly into the sun. An introduction to sun gazing. Find a comfortable spot with an unobstructed view of the sun. Feel the sun on your closed eyelids and slowly open. Holy moly. What in the heck is happening? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my god. All I've right. never heard of this woman. I've never heard of my life. So, yeah, I'm not surprised she's not on, on authority. I've never seen or heard of her. No. but And um, I've never heard of anybody say, uh, gaze directly into the sun. No. Everyone takes guess? that out of context. That what she really means is, you have the highest density of receptors to vitamin D on your eyelids and also in your actual eyeball. Um, mm-hmm. What they mean when they say it is you'd look towards the sun, but not directly at it. But sometimes people hear them say this and they think, oh, it's just staring directly at the white. You don't stare at the white light. Um, but it's, it's great for regulating circadian rhythm, but I don't know if this one's staring <laughs> at it. should be blind very yeah. quickly. I, I buy into the like not wearing sunglasses thing. And like you said, kind of, you know, looking off in the general direction, but to gaze directly into the sun and you're going to show us how on TikTok. Yikes. This is like eating Tide Pods, (laughs) y'all. Or huffing paint. I like huffing. Nicole, you know you have paint. (laughs) Don't don't pretend. (laughs) Man, please don't do that. Don't do prehistoric humans like that either. They were smart enough to know not to do that. But that's what I'm saying. There's no rules here. There's no logic to the whole thing. Like, what is with all the vegetable hate? Cabbage is bullshit. Broccoli is bullshit. Kale is bullshit. Wow, a person standing at the grocery store wearing a t-shirt with their dietary beliefs on it while simultaneously doing this with their eyes. That is the type of person I'm going absolutely nowhere near. Also, does this guy not already feel so much so like the type of person who would be irritated at vegans for being zealous or overly enthusiastic about their beliefs while simultaneously being guilty of the exact same thing? Oh, and here's a video of him accosting a vegan guy at the grocery store. Where are you going to get choline from? Where are you going to get creatine from? Where are you going to get car- plants? No, there's no creatine in plants. Where are you going to get carnitine from? Where are you going to get... Where are you going to get, uh, where are you going to get answering and touring? Where are you going to get vitamin K2? You ever heard of vitamin K2? I'm telling you, all our food is in plants. No. All our herbs, <laughs> all our herbs in plants. You can't stand in the vegetable section with an antagonistic t-shirt on, eyes bugged right out of your skull, picking fight. Paul's also not wearing shoes, by the way. I've seen this video, so he's wearing Kayla's bullshit while not wearing shoes. 
or socks. That's all I wanted to say. Anything that you guys want to add? Shall I continue? Just continue. It's <laughs> with people trying to buy vegetables. That is so out of line. Imagine a vegan standing in the meat section yelling meat is murder and harassing you while you're just trying to buy your weenies. No matter what side you're on, it's equally not cool. Also, is he not wearing shoes? Comment. Yes, I always take advice from people walking around barefoot. This guy, Paul Saladino, calls himself Carnivore MD and seems to be one of the main, if not the main, authority on the topic of carnivore diets. I know he's been around for a while, but this was my first introduction to him. And I just wonder, what about this starter pack made him think that this was a reasonable, authoritative move? This is not good for humans. Despite what you've been told, get it out of your diet, you'll feel better. Kale is bullshit. Get your kale is bullshit shirt and make everybody in the grocery store curious and look at you just like they're looking at me as I'm waving kale around here. You know what's up. Paul's also been... I don't think that's why they're staring at him. I think it's because he's not wearing shoes in the grocery store. And now he's not wearing a shirt. And that poor man just trying to buy his veggies for the week. Like, he just got off work. He's he's, he's accosted by a man that's wearing... Oh, man, think, this is a lot. I think he'd be <laughs> better served for his time if he did this in, like, the candy bar section where people do actually, you know, deliberately buy junk food. Yeah. I think that would have more impact. Whereas someone that's going to buy fresh fruit and vegetables, chances are they're going to be probably plant-based anyway. And the whole the food's The target is part. not vegans. The target is not vegetarians. Those are no. not the people that are doing, you know, but those are it's not funny people we need to educate. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. So like, when we think about veganism, vegetarianism, it's like a tiny minority, maybe a few percentage of the total totality of people. We think about the people that would try this diet out, people that would see the most benefit. Um, in like the in the whole number, like the demographic, you're looking at like the average person going to shops, buying the potato chips, candy bars, cola, things like that. They're people that you could pull over. So I'd actually be in this supermarket, not going to the vegetables, I'd be going to the chocolate bar section and saying, oh, what's that? Or do you know it contains this, 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 you know, this sort of thing. But, you know, it's meant, it's meant to be sensationalistic. It's meant to be marketable, isn't it? So that's why, why they do it, I think. Yeah, but it's not it's not warranted. Like that's what we criticize vegans doing, right? But like I don't talk to anyone about food unless they ask me. I mean, I'm talking outside of YouTube because that's what we do YouTube for. But outside of YouTube, if I'm out to eat or I'm shopping or whatever, and I see someone buying something stupid, I don't take that as permission to go up to them and say, "Why are you buying potato chips? You know they're cooked in seed oils. You know they're this. You know they're that." Like it's just so unnecessary if someone asks you a question and you want to do it as educational purposes fine but it's honestly it's not your business what people are putting into their mouth or their or their body and i think he's no better than the people we criticize on the other side of the aisle right so he's just no this is just a bad a bad look well and, also, and no shirt and shoes is also a bad look yeah no shirt no shoes no service what happened to that um, and also, I don't necessarily, I don't watch his stuff at all. So, like, he is definitely not the authority for me. Um, you know, I, I know he's pretty big and, and a lot of people do, but he's not the, you know, like the go to for me. Yeah, he's excellent at cherry picking. That's the only thing I say at that. He's excellent at cherry picking. I've been on his videos before and critiqued them on the actual video in the comment section and said, Study one, two, three, four that you listed. Here's all the problems of each one. No clicks, no likes, nothing, no comment back. And I was like, well, okay. But he's not up to debating people. Um, he won't hold debates with people because he is automatically right. You know, that's part of the problem. Like we should be able to, at least if we're out there promoting ourselves as, as an expert, if someone went to me, Nicole or Kim and said, oh, I think plants are good. Okay, why's that? This, that and the other. I don't like your videos. Okay, let's have a debate about it. Bring up three studies. We'll analyze each one beforehand. Then we'll critique each other. Then we'll do it in a fair sort of way. But I think, like Nicole said, just going up to people in the shop is bizarre. But if he was going to do it, I'd be doing it in the candy bar section. So, Yeah, I think he has debated people. I've seen some of his debates. 
the thing is, I, I agree. You can say the same thing with any study too, like low carb. You can you can pick every single study apart. So I don't necessarily think, and like I said, I'm not like pro Saladino or whatever. I'm just trying to be objective. Um, but I don't think... I don't think he's necessarily cherry picking. I I don't know, but I, I think he pulls up a bunch of different studies. But yeah, of course, there's going to be flaws in the studies he picks out. And of course, you're going to be able to find a study to refute the studies he puts out. And I think that's the whole problem with all these studies is you pull up one study, then you can find another study like a second later to completely debunk everything you just pulled up. So it's hard to say, like, if is he really cherry picking or is this just what he's finding on what he's researching? So I, I don't know. It's it's really hard. It's it's a really tough claim to to make. I think I a lot of the problem. Sorry, Karen. Sorry, Karen. Kim, sorry. <laughs> carry on. Did you just carry call on. me Karen? <laughs> sorry, carry on, Kim. <laughs> okay. Um, just one little interjection here. I think that a lot of the problem um, in America as well as the world, I'm sure is that most people don't know how to interpret studies. Most people don't know how to um, distinguish a good study from a bad study. And that's why we end up with things on the news that are like, you know, they say that if you do 10 jumping jacks, you'll get pregnant uh, the next morning, you know. <laughs> <Just What? stupid. laughs> I'm never doing jumping jacks again. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I would argue that he is cherry picking. And the reason why I say this is because he did produce a book a few years ago, two, three, four years ago, talking about specific studies. Now, with what he's saying now being so opposi oppositional to what he's saying prior to that, how can he contradict himself? Because if he was so righteous and correct in the first place, why has he then changed his views and gone 180? You know, it doesn't make sense. Are you not allowed um, to change your views? Oh, again, I'm just you're allowed to, to change your yeah. Yes, you're allowed to change your views, and there's no issue with that. But there's a hierarchy of evidence. So um, Kim, Kim, Nurse Kim, actually alluded to that in her talk a second ago. So she is saying most people can't understand statistical analysis of studies. And that's completely correct. Mm -hmm. I, can I can understand these things. I did study advanced statistical analysis in university. I'm no, no means a world expert, but if I can just about put a handle on his sort of evidence, evidence what you what it, what it is, then how is the average person that isn't trained in this able to do that? They're not. So what he's saying is a influencer, a MD, never actually practiced as a medical doctor apparently. Um, how can he go out and say that if he his audience can't manage to understand it themselves? So it's just hearsay. Um, now, when you pit up his views against someone else's views, like Professor Barquet or Dr. Anthony Chafee, they'd walk circles around them. But what he does is a tactic which they use in debates, which is technically against the rules. And it's basically winning by bombardment. So they'll have a load of studies, like 15 studies to support one point. But when you look through them one by one, it's like, oh, that's a rat study. Oh, that's a mouse study. That doesn't take into account the circadian rhythm. The animal in this study does, I don't know, is um, nocturnal. You know, it, there's too many variables, so it changes a lot of the outcomes. So him to go in there and say you know it's a it's a good study i i couldn't agree with it at all i think he has backtracked he's gone full circle to appeal to the masses his pocketbooks probably increased a lot in that time um and i'm just not not for it i don't see people adding in fruit and honey to this degree as we've mentioned before nicole and benefiting from it ever i've never seen a benefit from it so anecdotally with however many thousand people there are or million people in the carnival space, we've seen this to not be true at all. But then we've said about tolerability, and I think that does come into it as well. But this proposal, these things are good for you. No, I, I don't agree. I think they're generally a net negative, but some people, they're an absolute net negative. So that's just my two cents. Also, can I just add that he's literally standing next to a display of flip-flops? <laughs> can he not just grab some? I mean, Kim with her observational skills on point. I assess for a living, y'all. <laughs> I'm prone to wearing no shirt at the grocery store. Like, dude, you're disturbing the peace. Modern society might be wrong about some things, but no shirt, no shoes, no service is not one of them. People have the right to buy their groceries without your juices all over them. 
The thing is, though, we've been so horribly wrong about basically everything when it comes to nutrition that I'm so open to the argument that maybe it is biologically appropriate for humans to eat more fatty red meat. Grass-fed meat is certainly very nutrient-dense. It's a whole food. So to me, it's automatically better than 90% of what you can buy at the grocery store. And the carnivore guys are big on eating the organs too very big on it, which is a practice that almost every ancient community seems to have engaged in that we've since lost. But why do the carnivores have to take that idea to the extreme? Where is the vegetable hate coming from? No. I guess if the people in the carnivore world, or at least this guy and some others, vegetables contain dangerous compounds. And the benefit of a carnivore diet is that you eliminate all of these anti-nutrients found in plants. <gasps> but Ben, I thought plants were good for you. Not the case most of the time. Kill you from the inside out. They contain the chemicals, the lectins, the oxalates, the phytates, and last I looked, all vegetables, fruit, fiber, seeds, and nuts are mostly sugar, which causes glycation and damages your body. Stop eating plants. No. How do you know, bros? How do you know? That's a nice story. Sounds plausible enough. Where's the evidence? Thing is, vegetables have a lot of solid data linking them to good health. That's an undeniable fact. Tons of studies linking them to good health, which is another major issue with carnivore thinking. For some reason, these guys have decided that every bit of evidence that contradicts their beliefs just doesn't count. Of course, all the evidence linking red meat to ill health also doesn't count. And like I said, nutrition science is messed up in so many ways and there are so many nuances that it really is hard to say one thing one way or another. These red meat studies could be very wrong, but they could also be very right and these studies exist. You can't just write off and ignore all evidence contrary to your belief and then cite one-off cherry-picked sources to support. Did you have something, Jonathan? Yeah. Yeah, she's kind of saying like, okay, for example, glycation. How she's saying like how would you prove that? Well that there are mechanisms around this. It's not hearsay. You can prove that someone has a higher level of glycation and you'll see that their cells will actually age faster. So if you look at, for example, Brian Johnson on YouTube, he's an anti aging kind of guy, he spends millions on it. And he's sort of logging what he does. He has something called the blueprint. And he's trying to create the optimal environment to age the slowest and live the longest. Um, and what he's doing is he's actually doing different tests. And he's finding different changes from the body, his blood chemistry, his skin cells, his tissues, all over his body. And he's working out how much they age. And he's comparing, you know, point A intervention, whatever he does, takes a supplement, drug, whatever. Point B intervention, sees, sees what happens. So he has like a washout period between them. And he sees, yes, his, his skin does age faster. There's different scans and tests you can use. So this is mechanistic. It is provable. Um, and it does seem to be anecdotal. I mean, a lot of the carnival people I see, particularly ones that are significantly older, don't look significantly older. I mean, there's that 85-year-old woman. She looks about 60 or something like that. And you've got other people as well. Um, like Rick, Charger Mopar. I think he's about 50, roughly. And he looks about maybe late 30s, 40. So it kind of tells me, yeah, there certainly is a benefit. So it's a, about drawing line between mechanisms and anecdotes. Um, and I think this lady would just like to see a full video, like what Dr. Chafee's done, Sean Baker, Bart K, where they've talked about all these things, put it on a, a succinct video, and then she'd be oh, okay, fair enough. But I think she's misinformed. And she's just taking it, obviously, at face value, which is tricky when you're objectively looking at something and all you can see is a one, two-minute reel, for example, you know. I think that's why she focused on TikTok, though, because if she would have said YouTube carnivores are wild, she would have been over here like, <laughs> you know, this is boring because <laughs> um, it's totally different. Yeah, also, I think she's she made um, a fair point and she is looking at it objectively, which which I like. Um, she is, So she's trying to be fair to, to both sides. Um, I think she's saying back to the study thing that you were talking about, Jonathan, <clears throat> and then Kim alluded to. So when you're, when you're looking at all these studies, there is a ton of data, whether you agree or not, there's a ton of data studies, you know, putting the benefits, the benefits of plants, um, a ton of studies, slews of them. And then there's equal amount of studies demonizing meat red meat and saturated fat specifically now while a lot of those studies are 
not looking at the hamburger pie or looking at all the other stuff that goes with it. But I, I think I think one of the other points she made is if there's all these studies out here, this goes back to cherry picking, why are carnivores as a whole discounting all of the this data over here that shows the benefits of plants while at the same time all this data over here that that is showing the anti-benefits of red meat and saturated fat how do you discern what to believe what not to believe and how do we say saturated fat is is more beneficial than plants and make that conclusion again this is this is just uh, I guess me coming at it from her point of view and and what I think she's kind of getting at with with that statement um here so what do you, what do you think about that yeah it comes down to the hierarchy of evidence i mentioned earlier so for example you know you said from her point of view she probably thinks oh there's all these studies which say plants are good for you um i don't think there's a study out there which says i don't know turmeric is great for long-term health outcomes there won't be what they do instead is they measure a supplement, so for example, curcumin, something like that, and I'll say, this is great for the body because it reduces this inflammatory marker, something like that, and it lowers this inflammation level based on these pain scores in this test group of however many hundred people. Well, yes, it may do that, but we're talking about a plant extract that's different to a plant in its whole food form itself. So there's some examples where processing foods, extracting things out of them, chemical compounds is useful, but sometimes it's not useful. So for example, um, 500 milligrams of curcumin might be beneficial to someone with inflammatory issues, joint pain, something like that. But 500 milligrams of turmeric, the whole food plant, could be deleterious to, I don't know, um, iron deficiency anemia. It leaches iron from the body. That's literally what it does. It might cause more gut dysbiosis. There might be contaminants within the whole food. So it's it's like they, they think these things are like for like for example sulfurophane oh it's a great compound within broccoli which does this that never okay it turns off certain genes and allows certain inflammatory markers to reduce or it might promote glutathione from the hormetic effect fine but the reality is the same thing isn't true for broccoli you eat broccoli which it originally comes from and to get the same content of sulfurophane you have to eat like five heads of broccoli or something stupid What's that going to do for you? That's going to be so high in fiber, in which case too much fiber is not good for you. And the only study we have on fiber is saying fiber is bad for you. So that kind of obliterates the plants are good for you kind of point. Um, and the next thing is about, you know, populations. We obviously know epidemiology. It's not a great way to measure what people are taking in through their food and take, like you said, about the hamburger with the bun, stuff like that. So you can't draw conclusions from non-causal evidence. You need a controlled study with a fair even group of people cause and effect find out what the intervention is and see if it makes a difference or not but studies like that don't exist really ever which is really frustrating so we have to extrapolate mechanistically anecdotally from what we have so that's why she's not understanding this she's obviously i imagine she's a health influencer of some sort maybe i don't know but Oh no, not, she she talks a lot about the fat body positivity and the that sort of stuff because that's like I said in the beginning she was obese. So she talks a lot about those types of influencers, but not necessarily a health expert or whatever. No. I see. Yeah, yeah so she's coming from it like the angle you said. So yeah. objectively she's gonna see it in a completely different light. Like if I sat down with her and explained that to her for like half an hour, she'd be like, Oh, fair enough. That makes sense. Okay, maybe next time I read a study I need to look through it, not just go to conclusions like everyone does. Read the study, read the outline of the study. You know, is it a good intervention or not? What do you think, Kim? I just, um, I agree with that. That was what I was going to say, basically, was that um, it sounds like she's referring to a lot of epidemiolog epidemiological studies, if I can say it, um, and that maybe she hasn't been um, trained to um, interpret studies for, you know, how, how good of a study it is, if it's controlled, randomized, all that stuff. Um, because if when when you say there's a lot of studies that show this, that red meat's bad, um, and there's a lot of studies that show that vegetables are good, um, I would like to see some actual 
like like what studies are you referring to? Because um, I think most are, you know, the food questionnaire studies where uh, how many cups of um, ribs have you eaten in the last year? Um, I heard somebody say the other day, like, who measures ribs in cups? You can tell that was a vegetarian that made that study. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I mean, you can't just... And this is a problem, too, in in our country, especially in my country. (laughs) Um, But but in the world, um, putting all these studies together without, you know, rating them for the public, it's it's really unfair. And it's really um, it's just expecting them to have a level of knowledge that they do not have and they're probably never going to have. And they're just helpless. And and then it just leaves it up to the government to be like, oh, yeah, this is what you should do, you know, Um, without much proof provided or required. You know, it's just and I understand why people just say, oh, yeah, meat's bad. Red meat's bad because I heard it was, you know, I've heard it a lot. And you start to think that that's real evidence that you've just heard something a lot, (laughs) you know, Um, or that there's just a lot of people saying in papers that have been published um, that this is so, so I must believe it. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that's just always been a problem. And, and I really wish that there was some kind of, um, division we could put between things that are just, you know, opinion pieces or (laughs) epidemiological pieces, and then actual like controlled, randomized, you know, hardcore, uh, studies, our course, the official medical term, of course. I don't know if you can do a complete, like, I mean, you can't, uh, you're limited on the control studies, especially with humans, right? Because we can't lock them in the lab. Exactly. That's my point. point. Right. But the, but the, but the, the further the point is what makes it more complicated is the way the papers are published. The headline is catchy, Right. And it, and it oftentimes, and I'm not a study expert, but it oftentimes will, the headline won't match the actual conclusion that they were actually trying to prove or whatever. But most people don't look at that. Most people do what Jonathan, you know, said, you read the headline, they read the conclusion and that's the problem. And, and these papers are demonizing one thing and glorifying another thing. So the everyday person who's lazy, and no offense to all the watchers, but it's true, right? Like our attention span is extremely short. Um, they're only going to read the cliff notes. And if the cliff notes are saying saturated fat increases the risk of X, Y, Z, that's all they're going to see without reading the entire thing and understanding what they're reading. That's That I think is part of the problem is you know, the everyday person isn't trained in studies. I wasn't trained in interpreting studies. You know, I learned a lot from Bart Kay and Jonathan and those people who were trained. And, you know, I'm, I'm in the health field. Registered dietitians are not trained to read studies. The medical doctors aren't trained. So it's, it's a huge problem. And I think scientists and researchers and people putting these studies together know that, and they write them in the way to take advantage and to kind of make us believe what they believe while the data may not even show that to be true. So I think there's a, it's a huge, huge d- dumpster fire. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that's, that was kind of part of what I was saying was that people are not trained to read those studies. So they just kind of take anything that a person of authority says to them and say, Oh, that must be true. You know, I mean, because that's what I did. That's I, I can speak from experience on that. And I'm not an expert at reading studies by any stretch of the imagination. But um, in obtaining my bachelor's degree, I was introduced to it and taught enough to where I think I can kind of, you know, swim and not sink. But um, to even explain, to read all of these studies and then, which I do read quite a, I read a lot of studies. um, And then to explain that information to other people you know, it's, that's even difficult and it's by itself. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of information there. And um, so the average person, they're just not, and even if they were educated on it, there's a lot of people out there that are not really capable of, of doing that. And, you know, just a fact, (laughs) I mean, I deal with the general public every day and, you know, it's, 
it's it's not going to happen. <laughs> they have no interest, number one. And then even if they did have interest, it would probably take a lot of education for them to be able to do that. So I don't know. There, I feel like it needs to happen at a government level or, you know, at the at, at a level where I hate to exclude your country, Jonathan, <laughs> but in our country, it needs to happen at a government level where um, there are more restrictions on, you know, I'm not the expert on it, but I just I just think it needs to be clearer. You know, it needs to be, it doesn't need to be so difficult to tell what's healthy to eat and what's not healthy to eat. So, yeah, but it yeah, all I comes back to money, you know, it all comes back to who's making money where, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any stretch of the imagination, but if money, if there's money to be made, then people can be bought. And sugar is the biggest lobbyist on, on the Hill here in here in DC. Um, but thanks nurse butter. What do you got, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I did my university dis- dissertation in my third year on public health guidelines. So I understand them very, very well. And what I actually did was I was trying to work out the difference between the general public and gym users, the difference between them and how well they know the public health guidelines. Um, the gym users had a bit more knowledge than, say, the average general public uh, member, but still wasn't that great. Like, if the guidelines were any good and people followed them, they would have known all the guidelines. Um, so ask questions like, how many cups of water are recommended a day? What's the fiber intake recommendation? How many fruit and veg? Things like that. Um, you know, how much salt? All this sort of stuff. And people would get the five a day thing right, and they'd usually get the cups of water a day. But things like the fiber, they wouldn't get right. So it would tell me, okay, if they're getting, say, the recommendation of I think it's like 35 grams of fiber per day plus the fruit and veg. That's for men. Yeah, that's the men's range. Yeah. Women is um, uh, 25 to 29. Yeah, like their their yeah. whole diet would be plant based if it if that was to be possible. The reality is it isn't. Um, the fiber content is is lower, so people don't get any of the nutrition anyway. Then they're also being told to have more fiber, and I think a bit differently. Um, I won't censor myself, but I'll say it is a conspiracy and it is to to profiteer from. Um, I've seen that myself, even in a vegan health food shop. The vegan products were priced higher than the non-vegan products. And they're also promoted more. So they had, we give them more templates, more flyers, more posts, all these sort of things to promote the plant-based diet to a greater degree. Um, and it is never that we could sell beef liver. We couldn't sell collagen. All these sort of animal-derived products we couldn't really sell, and some of the staff worked with actually ward people off from buying fish oil and things like that, cod liver oil. They'd say, oh, no, just take turmeric. I'm like, well, turmeric's not an essential nutrient, but omega-3 is. How do, how do they define that logic? It doesn't make sense, but I, I would say it certainly is a conspiracy, and it is very frustrating. The last thing I'll say before... Conspiracies. I'm sorry. I think the conspiracy centers around it all goes back to money, though. You know, like that's why there's a conspiracy. It, it's not like some evil conspiracy. It's just like they want to make money and they have discovered this is a way to make money. You know, so anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say I wasn't going to say anything important. I was going to say, Jonathan, when you say F it in your thing. That means you don't have to send to yourself, right? You're even wearing the shirt. So set it free, Jonathan. I'm primed. Set it free. Fuck it. <laughs> what is the bottom part say? It says just eat. <laughs> <laughs> Support your hypothesis. Like, what are the rules of this carnivore world? Case in point, Paul Saladino's current rendition of the carnivore diet. Eat beef and fruit. This is the simplest version of an animal-based diet. Anyone can do this. So his version of carnivore is not just meat-based. It also includes fruit and honey, which sounds like a very healthy addition. But let's listen to his explanation for why. Fruit, sweet, colorful, clearly plants want to sweet their fruit. Fruit contains the least amount of defense chemicals. In stark contrast to things like vegetables, into which plants put many more defense chemicals because they don't want you to eat those things. Plants do want you to eat fruit. I mean, hey, sounds plausible, right? 
except this narrative is a somewhat recent development for him. Previously, he was 100% meat-based until that wasn't working out so well for his health. If you have Hashimoto's, don't make the same mistake I made. For years, I tried fixing my thyroid. After two years of a ketogenic carnivore diet, of just meat, organs, fat, and salt, I quit. I quit that ketogenic diet and I added fruit and honey to my diet. So Paul added in fruit and honey because his previous diet was messing with his health. So here he's going through his old lab work when he was like pure carnivore. But my free testosterone was 4.64, which is a little on the low side. 4.64, a little on the low side. You're literally a 80 year old hypogonadal man right now. Like that's what you're free test is. And now he has a whole story about how and why his current diet is the optimal diet for humans. Plants do want you to eat fruit. But in reality, what happened? He changed his diet out of necessity for his health. Then when it worked, he made up a story and looked for data to confirm his prior belief. And Paul's book, The Carnivore Code, if it hasn't been amended since it's been published, still lists sweet fruits as second tier toxic. So you can see when he was a full carnivore, sweet fruit was toxic. And now that he's been proven wrong, sweet fruit is specifically very nutritious. So you can see why there are major flaws to being particularly zealous about any sort of diet in the first place. Ultimately, you're looking for evidence to confirm your prior belief, to confirm whatever narrative you think is true about food. Most scientists agree on one point about our ancestral diet. It was varied. Tribe to tribe, place to place, we ate different foods and we were highly adaptable omnivores, which is potentially why we survived for so long. So if the ancestral story has no legs, then what is the point of the whole thing? Other than to sell books because the paleo diet was already taken. No. And that's really my problem with the carnivore diet. When you start making all these hard rules, you really start losing touch with truth and reality. In reality, there's no real logic to the whole thing. Carnivores make it seem like they're doing this because it was our ancestral diet, but really they all just kind of do whatever they want and have their own little narrative to go along with their choices. Nacho testes. Ooh, guys. That's... This guy's eating raw testicles and beef penis, but also Tostitos cheese on it. I mean, I know he's trolling, but like, what are the rules? I can't keep up. Like, I think another thing is too, what is with all the butter? Add butter, 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 add butter. Okay, but if you're eating carnivore to return to the hunter gatherer days, then what is with all the butter and the cheese? I'm pro butter in general. For years, everyone switched from cooking with butter and animal fats to eating margarine, which was marketed as the healthy, lower calorie alternative to butter, but which we later discovered was loaded with deadly trans fats and kind of just an overall scam. But what timeline of history are we talking about? Are we carnivorous hunter gatherers or are we making butter at home after the dawn of agriculture? There's so many plot holes and inconsistencies. The only version of carnivore that makes sense is the one where you're forced to eat just beef and salt because your body can't handle anything else. Everything else is just riddled with issues. Look at this carnivore Costco haul. Eggs, salmon, rotisserie chicken with some additives that she points out, ground beef, cheese, shredded cheese, egg bites, and cream cheese. You know, somehow I don't think that our ancestors were spreading Philadelphia cream cheese on their woolly mammoth legs. Also these egg bites here, the ingredients. They include locust bean gum, agar, and cultured celery powder. Not only is celery powder seemingly in the vegetable category and therefore not allowed, it's also the food industry's latest favorite trick. Cultured celery powder is really nitrate by another name. I believe it's a celery concentrate, but it performs the same function as a nitrate. The food industry likes to do this thing where when people become concerned about an ingredient, ingredient such as nitrates instead of removing it they find a way to put it in but under a more friendly sounding name if all the benefits of the carnivore diet come from returning to this mythical carnivorous ancestral way of eating then you're doing it wrong by eating nitrates locust bean gum and any other food that's not the whole animal right i hate to break it to you but if your carnivore meal looks like this make a carnivore friendly cake with me i took half a cup of cream cheese and then i did some warm Warmed up mascarpone, and then I made some whipped cream. The milk and cheese inclusion, that is just for fun. And that's okay, but then why do the carnivore diet at all unless you have some sort of physical issue that makes it the best option for you? Why not just eat a varied whole food based diet? You could still even base it around meat. Meat could still be the star of the show if you believe that meat nutrients are somehow superior to plant nutrients. But all the arbitrary rules are just unnecessary, even just from a logic perspective. And I'm seriously convinced that all these rules just exist because the paleo diet was already taken and carnivore sounds way cooler. Which brings me 
finally to the testicles. This is a favorite among carnivores. You can't do a video on carnivores without talking about the testicle consumption. Why? Just why? Raw as well? Why does that have to be part of it? I could not find a single study on the validity of this. Personally, I like testicle okay. and I've been eating raw testicle for like the last year. There's interesting things in it and it could just be all placebo, man. But I feel like there's a libido boost when you eat it. Maybe there's boron in the testicle. It could be a lot of different things. I like testicle. That is one beefy leap of faith. You would think that people would wait until there was like a stack of evidence before jumping balls deep into a literal fear factor meal. I'm not going to go too much more into the testicles. I'm sure that there's a carnivore narrative about why they're the most important food in the world to eat. But I think that this post from Lane Norton really sums up what the main problem with the carnivore diet is. Nutrition is the new religion. What when I was on the Joe Rogan podcast, I made a point to say that I don't hate any particular diet. I just hate bullshit. I don't hate keto. I hate that keto zealots try to twist the scientific data to fit the narrative that insulin is why you can't eat fat. I don't hate vegan diets. I hate that vegan zealots have to fear monger and drastically exaggerate the dangers of meat. I don't hate the carnivore diet. I hate that people promote it as a cure for various diseases with zero evidence for it. I don't hate intermittent fasting. I hate that people promote it as superior for fat loss and as some kind of longevity miracle. I don't hate any diet. I hate misrepresenting scientific data to push an agenda. All of these groups are guilty of this. Why? It's their identity. They had success with a particular approach and became enthusiastic about it. They sought out other people who were enthusiastic about it. They marinated their minds in an echo chamber chamber of reinforcing their biases and cognitive dissonance. Over time, they start to identify as that diet group. This is why you see so many people with keto or carnivore or vegan as the first thing in their bio. Literally, the first thing they use to describe themselves is how they eat. Now you've reached a level of zealotry where you cannot listen to reason. You can't even consider any contrarian evidence because it violates your entire identity. Don't fall into this nonsense of making nutrition your religion and identity. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Check out this video. One sec. We're back. We're back, people. Um, yeah, before we give our final thoughts, um, uh, what I do, and I'm sure Jonathan and Kim will follow suit, um, I do plan to split this up into at least two two different videos to to break it up, a part one, part two, maybe part one through three. So this is a, a longer video, but um, I thought this would be a good one to react to. So with that being said, Jonathan, what are your final thoughts on that last bit we just listened to? There was a lot to unpack there. Yeah, there certainly was. I think some of the key points were like, how far back do we go if we're going to claim a carnivore diet is based on this data of being you know mostly meat well fine I, I think that's probably the mainstay of our diet now we've got more modern foods where we've processed things we've milked animals with great dairy stuff like that to store nutrients so you know the, the butter for example that dates back to biblical times so we're talking thousands of years ago and the chances are if our area in the world we're constantly eating that up until this point so in my case um north northern european yes we certainly did eat a lot of butter so i've had epigenetic adaptation to tolerate that and consume that more than say somewhere where it wasn't as possible for example you go to kenya they're not making butter it's too hot they wouldn't have made it for thousands of years it would have went rancid so quickly so that's where i think the individuality goes into it um another thing i want to just quickly say is like the idea of an animal based diet is only above 50 percent animal foods a carnivore diet is technically speaking if you're talking about hyper carnivore 70 percent plus but what the average person's defining in terms of our space like the average carnivore infant you might say they're saying something like maybe 80 90 percent meat with some eggs with some dairy with some fish if you tolerate it and like it that's what the diet entails. Now, what Paul Saladino was promoting wasn't what we know as the carnivore diet. It was a load of organs with some meat that was too lean, with not enough fat, and also probably some other things that are going behind the scenes which people won't talk about. That's why he's getting the issues that he was. Um, and he didn't go through the right experimentation to work out what was the optimal diet for him. Now, the difference between someone like that and for example, Dr. Sean Baker is Dr. Sean Baker right now. He's had a issue of his cervical spine, I believe, um, near the top near his neck, I think. 
and he's actually changing his diet. So he's still on a kind of a diet, but he's applying a more ketogenic approach. So imagine by macronutrient ratio, it's got a higher amount of fat in it relative to protein. So he's changing things up, but he's still strict within the same realm. Now, what I want to know is how did Paul Saladino get from eating zero grams of carbohydrates, plants were bad, fruit is bad, don't eat anything colorful, to eating 300 grams of carbs per day? The difference is stark. It's it's absurd. Um, so that's my biggest um, objection to that kind of thing. What do you guys think? Nurse butter. You go next, Nicole. <laughs> I'm still formulating my answer. Um, yeah. So there was definitely a lot to unpack there. I I I agree um, with most of what. Kiana said, I agree that um, we didn't eat 100% meat only um, if we're coming at it from an evolutional standpoint. Um, evolution, evolutionarily, <laughs> we, we did eat a more varied diet than what is promoted by um, Dr. Kilt, unless he was being extreme. Like I said, I don't really watch a lot of his content, but in the clips he, she showed, he was being extreme and like what Paul Saladino was when he first came out, like how these, how a lot of people in our space, there are people who are more extreme than others. And I think, I don't know if we're omnivores. I don't know the technical definition of all these titles because I don't really title myself uh, or really care about titles, but I do believe and, and I'm, I'm talking about this more, but I do personally believe that, yes, meat has been a predominant component of our diets throughout our history. It's been predominantly meat and fish um, and, and those sorts of things, right? Depending on where you are in the world, the Arctic ate more seal and more, more fish than probably people in Africa and other parts of the world. So I think depending on where you are will would dictate what you ate because you ate from the land. And that's what's different from today. And and that's where I think we can all kind of come together and and agree. The the types of fruits, vegetables and the carb the carbs, the carby foods that we eat today are a hundred percent different than, you know, what we ate hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, a hundred percent. Um, but that's not to say that we didn't eat we didn't eat any fruit or veg throughout our history. Yes, they're different. Our, the meat we eat are is different than we ate hundreds of thousands of years ago as well. So it's not just it's not just the fruits and vegetables that are different and genetically modified and all that stuff. Our meat is different too, right? So when when we're talking ancestors, if you want to talk about the diet through evolution, they used to eat the whole animal, head to, head to tail. They used to eat the organs. They used to drink the blood and all that. Now, they get rid of the fatty bits at the butcher shop. They drain all the blood. So, like, our nutrient profile we're getting from meat is drastically different than the nutrient profile of our ancestors, if we're talking evolution. Um, so, it, it's not just the fruits and vegetables that are different. It is the meat. We are eating different food all of it is different than what our ancestors ate. Um, but I personally don't believe we are lions. I don't believe we're lionesses. I do believe we, we, we were carb eaters, not like today and not 300 grams like Saladino. Um, but I do believe we did eat some level of carbs. And I think if people just stay in the ketogenic realm, I think that is, our, our natural and optimal way of eating, um, whatever that looks like for you. But I don't believe, and I think Kiana, this is kind of what she was saying towards the end, is she, I come at it from the standpoint is you don't have to be zero unless you're the outliers like um, the Petersons that have, you know, these specific issues. If you're not that specific with autoimmune, you really don't need to be zero for the rest of your life. And I think that's what Kiana was getting at at the end that I really loved is that, and, and kind of Lane Norton was saying the same thing about demonizing all these diets and cherry picking studies, which is what Jonathan kind of stated earlier. Um, but I think if, if meat and animal foods is predominant and you just, and you want to incorporate carbs, like I've incorporated some carbs back, 
um, Nurse Kim is, and I know very many other people are incorporating carbs back. Just don't make that the star of the show, right? Carbs, you should not be 50, 60% carbs. The star of the show should be meat 100%. And if you are going to have carbs in your diet, the types of carbs matter and they shouldn't be the star of the show. And I like she said that, not in that way, but she kind of said that at the end and and I appreciated that. So that's kind of like my my thoughts on that. Kim? So I agree with a lot of what both of you just said, but um, I also agreed with probably 80% of that video. I really did not expect that. When I went into it, I was like, huh, giving a stank face at first in my mind, you know. Um, but what she said was actually, most of it was really rational and uh, she tried to be as unbiased as possible. Um, and I appreciated that. And I probably will follow her. Um, she seems like she's a very intelligent person, but um, I made myself some notes here. So um, I think it's really important that we're not so dogmatic. And I think we all can kind of go down that path because it is like when we get with all of our people and and we get to, you know, getting all of the noise up as far as, you know, um, it, all of the different things that we're adding in and then and the experiences they've had and 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 we put it all together and we're like, OK, this is our dogma. You know, we need to not do that. This is not a religion. Um, this is a very individualized personal experience um, for what is helping to heal our body. And then once we get to be where we're mostly healed, where our body's in a um, state of a normal human being again, and we're not just, we don't have all these problems and we're not like severely overweight, then um, we can probably add some stuff back um, even further than we would right now. You know, I'm adding a few things back now, um, but in the long, in the grand scheme of things, um, I'd like to just be a normal person, you know, not not have to sit and think about what I'm eating all the time. Because, I mean, while it's kind of a hobby, it's I can think of other hobbies I'd rather do. You know, this just helps me feel better. So um, but we mainly need to be open to changing our ideas if new information comes along. You know, that's what science is. That's what scientists do. Scientists are not set in their beliefs you know a belief is not science um a belief is more tied to religion or you know something else um as scientists which we should all be a little bit of scientists uh with ourselves especially um if new information comes becomes available you should be open to you know looking into it and to changing your your mind about that um and then three uh real foods whole foods um, are good for, you know, everybody. <laughs> so um, they may be able to tolerate different ranges of those. They may be more limited, like you said, with Michaela. Um, but I think even, I've even heard Michaela say that um, that she would like to try to add something back in and to see what happens at this point, because she has been doing the beef and salt for so long. Um, and, and our body may tolerate it once she has healed whatever, whether it be like mitochondrial uh, damage, dysfunction, and or, you know, autoimmune, whatever it may be. Um, and then I think that everybody should avoid the inflammatory foods for the most part and also the processed foods. We were never meant to eat all of that processed food. And I think that's what has got the majority of our health in not so great you know, just, just got us in not such a great shape. Um, but you know, the sugars, the, uh, wheat, uh, well, the grains, the sugars, the grains and the seed oils, if we all just eliminated those three things and ate, you know, food in its whole forms or minimally processed forms, I think that we could see huge improvements in our health that way. So that's what I tell my children, you know, I don't tell them, oh, you need to do what mom does. You need to be keto or you need to be carnivore. They don't have any health issues that would warrant that. You know, that's kind of like a total reset type thing. You know, um, that's kind of like a, you know, the elimination diet of elimination diets because I've gotten so far, you know, in the wrong direction that I need to come back 
a little bit, come drastically come back before I can kind of even out in the center. Um, you know, if somebody chooses to eat meat for the rest of their life, I think it'd be perfectly fine. But personally, that's not, that wasn't my goal from the beginning. It's not my goal now. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to try to do what my body will allow me to do. And then maybe once here and there, like as you speak of the food freedom thing, you know, I'd like to get to a point where if there's a birthday celebration and I choose to eat a piece of ice cream cake that I love, have always loved, I'll be able to have a little sliver of it and not, you know, you don't want to be like orthorexic about things. Foods are not just good and bad and, you know, we need to be more you know, realistic about, about things like that. Um, and then let's see here. I think that was actually it, but yeah. So, but I, I really enjoyed this today and, uh, thanks for letting me sit in kind of last minute. You're always welcome nurse butter. So Jonathan, do you have any final words after, or anything to add after you heard, uh, Batgirl and nurse butter talk? Mr. Epic. Yeah. Yeah, fuck it. Damn it, we're going to get demonetized. I would have to bleep this crap out. Church, it's only I'm the first not seven seconds. Out. <laughs> it's only the first few seconds, I think, so we'll be right. Yeah, 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. You don't have anything to add? No, I think okay. that's as content as possible. I think um, hopefully this lady will watch our video back and perhaps have some more information, a bit of background. So maybe. Yeah, I tagged her. I did a couple, like, I think two previous reactions of her videos, um, positive, and uh, I tagged her, tagged her on both, so I'm wondering if she's seen any of them, but um, yeah, so again, this is a, a longer reaction video. I do want to thank Jonathan and uh, Nurse Kim for, for joining me. It's always, it's always fun hearing different perspectives, and I actually thought going into it that I would be the devil again, and Nurse Kim and Jonathan would be the angel, but it seemed like the three of us were kind of in synergy and kind of... Uh, had the same opinions which is always pleasant um but thank you guys for tuning in again i plan to split this up in multiple parts i'm sure um jonathan and nurse kim will do the same because it is a longer one so thank you for sticking uh with us throughout this whole reaction and review please do check out kiana's channel um after you watch this video um and drop her a sub she really does do great videos and does have an open mind i really enjoy her content um other than that stay tuned for future videos please feel free to drop us a sub and a thumbs up on all of our videos that'd be greatly appreciated and have a happy and healthy day see you later build muscle and lose fat on the carnivore diet 